You guys hear me okay? All right. Who, who, thanks for coming. Who in this room is now or has at some time been in creative services? Raise your hand. Higher, I'm old, I can't see. Great. Who here has at some time had trouble getting paid by a client for work they were doing? All right. Raise your hand if any of these are familiar to you. We ended up not using the work. All right. It's really not what we wanted after all. All right. Who's familiar with Goodfellas? All right. We got somebody internal to do it instead. <laughs> Fuck you, pay me. We canceled the project. Fuck you, pay me. We actually didn't get the money that we, the funding that we thought we were going to get. There we go. We think we've already paid you enough. It's really not what we were hoping for. Thank you. That's the title of our talk today. Fuck you, family. <laughs> So my name is Mike Montero. Uh, some of you may know me from Twitter as Mike for the win, uh, so the profanity shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, when, I, when Erica Hall, who's sitting supportively over there, and I started Mule ten, 10 years ago now, we uh, wanted to run our own design shop because we wanted to pick and choose the clients that we were going to work with. And we wanted to be responsible, ultimately, for what we were putting out in the world. And um, we had worked together at a couple places, and we were um, naive enough to think that we could run a business better than the people who we were working for. Uh, we, didn't, we were so excited about working together that it didn't occur to either of us, or maybe we each thought that the other one had it, but neither of us really had enough business experience to be running a company. Because of that, we ended up leaving a lot of money on the table. We ended up not negotiating contracts properly. We ended up not renegotiating contracts when we should have renegotiated them. But since we're still here and we're doing pretty well, I think we've, learned, we've actually learned a little bit about how to run a design business. And if you're running a design business, this stuff is part of the job as well as the creative work. Because this is a business. And you got to keep the lights on. You got to pay people. You got to meet payroll. And most importantly, you got to get clients. We love our clients at Mule. They are people who have, for the most part, worked their butts off to get a budget, enough to hire a design team to do the work. And of all the choices they could have gone with, they went with us. So we want to do really great work for them. And most, well, I, all clients, I think, start the business relationship with the best of intentions. And things go wrong, things that you weren't expecting. Uh, you know, the market changes, 
or you know, the person who hired you leaves, or you know, somebody has a bad mood day, but things change. And when those things change, you need to make sure that the relationship between you and the client is set in place in, in something like a contract. We recently came across this on Quora, which is apparently a site for posting questions to show how smart you are. <laughs> so what is good advice for how to deal with a client who refuses to pay for design work because of obviously false irrational reasons? Let's leave off the obviously false irrational reasons because we're not doing therapy today. Um, but. The, f the answer that we found under this question was you could try a heart-wrenching letter. <laughs> I'm going to go get some water. <laughs> Thank you. You could try a heart-wrenching letter, and you could lose all credibility that you have with that client. Because the minute that you write a heart-wrenching letter, the minute you appeal to their emotions, you have given up any bit of leverage that you had in that relationship. You have shown them your belly. You have shown them that you don't think you have a leg to stand on other than playing upon guilt. You have become a bottom in that relationship. <laughs> it's good, right? <laughs> And more than anything, I would like designers to stop being bottoms and realize the amount of power that they actually have in a relationship. I guarantee that this person did not have a contract in place because this is the sort of thing that a contract irons out immediately what happens in a situation like this. And if this person had a lawyer, well, actually, if my lawyer were here, actually, my lawyer is here. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to sit on what's been called the lawyer perch. So, um, Gabe Levine, everybody. This yeah, guy's been keeping me out of jail for about six years. I, I don't know why I deserve applause, but when Mike asked me to, um, to, to come participate in this, I said yes right away. Um, my relationship with him has been great. He's, he's a fabulous client. Um, a little bit about me real quick. Um, I started my law practice at a big firm, as so many young lawyers do. Um, after two years, I realized it sucked. Um, I went and joined a small firm where I get to serve small companies like Mule Design. Um, and I enjoy working with them. And um, what I, what I enjoy most is preventing problems. Because when you have small companies as clients, um, you need to make sure that you, at the outset, take care of issues that are going to arise. And in the context of your jobs as web designers, you do that in your client services contracts. You make sure that if something goes wrong and you're not going to get paid, that there's a mechanism in there for dealing with that. Um, and to be blunt, um, with both Mule and um, other companies that have come to me in the early stages, their contracts can be, if they have them, a mess. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about how you want to um, deal with that, have confidence in your business, have confidence in yourself, structure your contracts to make sure that uh, you're protected. We're your favorite client, right? Absolutely my favorite client, hands down. If there are other clients in here, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> so the, the, the basic I mean, gist of a contract is clear definitions, clear expectations. Yeah, you, you want to make sure that you know, everybody understands what, what they've agreed to. Um, all too often when you're, when you're negotiating, people don't understand what they've agreed to. And that's something that um, I enjoy about working with Mike and Erica and all of their employees. Um, because I can explain something, they listen, they don't beat about the bush. Um, and, and the other side and Mule understand what they're agreeing to when they go into a contract. You don't want to just ignore something and make it muddled, not clear. Clear expectations, clear definitions. So we've put together our greatest hits of bad predicaments that <clears throat> Gabe and I have, um, Gabe has helped us with.
we were working for a large organization that um, the whole, the, we were working with a new, a new division for a new thing they were doing. And the project was going really great. They were all super smart. Everything was going, going fantastic. There was absolutely no sign that anything was going to go badly. One day, we walked in for a presentation. We waited in the lobby for 30 minutes. And then finally, they walked us up to an MTV VP's office who um, came back in and said, I've had the worst day. I just had to lay off so many people. Prick. <laughs> Uh, that entire division that we were working with was laid off that day. Um, at this, so, and, and we were told the project was over. At this point, there's nothing left in the room. They're gone, we're gone. There was a contract that stipulated they had to pay us. Had the contract not been in place, we would have spent a ton of time and energy and money trying to get paid for that job and probably ended up getting and we'd probably end up getting paid a significant portion less. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have when somebody comes to me and says, um, you know, I've got a job that I'm working on, I've done X hours, and they refuse to pay me. And I, my first question is, do you have a contract? Um, no is a really bad answer. Um, <laughs> the, the situation you find yourself in there is that the, the truth of the matter is I can write a mean letter. Um, or I can, you know, try the, you know, persuasive phone call. But if you if you have to file a lawsuit, um, you're going to want a written contract. Um, if you want to avoid a lawsuit and have persuasion early in, in your talks, you're going to want a written contract. You're going to want a written contract that has attorney's fees, so you don't have to worry about paying me twenty thousand dollars if it's going to cost that much to collect fifty. Um, they know that they have to pay that if they lose. So yeah, you would have collected significantly less without a contract. And the other thing to note in this particular project was one of the people who was actually laid off that day ended up sticking around for a couple weeks and ended up being an incredibly good ally for us. Um, and when they were trying to get out of paying us, she basically told them, fuck you, pay them. As happens often with their clients. <laughs> How many people here have, have um, been hired to do a project and halfway through the project, project requirements change, project goals change, it becomes a totally different project than the one you initially agreed to? I see a lot of nodding heads. Thank you. Um, at that point, the way our contract works, at that point, if you've changed goals in a project that much, that project is done. The contract closes, you settle up, and you open up a new contract. I've heard from way too many people who have, who have kept on working for the initial job, even though it turned out to be something totally different than what was originally agreed to. Yeah, and this, this can be a sticky point, but um, again, one of the things about working with Mule and, and you know, clients that I generally enjoy is they have confidence in their work. So when you're negotiating a sticky point like this, um, you know, I'm able to say that you, you hired them for, for their, their presentation and uh, the scope of work that they, they outlined for you. So if you want to change it, um, you, need to, uh, you need to negotiate a new contract or at least amend the scope of work which can act as a new contract. This is the biggest red flag in client services. If you ever hear this phrase, just walk away. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a matter of trust. Um, lawyers frequently have conversations with each other where one says to the other, what, you don't trust my client? No, that's not the case. Um, I don't know your client. Um, I don't know him from Adam. If I don't, as an attorney, do my job to make sure that my client's protected, which is assuming bad faith by the other side, I have to, I have to not trust them. And um, the fact of the matter is when you're doing business deals, and that's what you guys are doing when you're agreeing to provide services for money that you use to live, um, you don't want to trust the person th to pay you um, necessarily. You want to make sure that you get paid. We were actually negotiating a uh, pretty large project with a client that we were very excited to be working with. We had agreed on everything. We were down to payment terms. And they didn't want payment terms in the contract. And they said, you can trust us on that. Um, the project was scheduled to kick off like two days later and we ended up walking away from it because you cannot start a relationship like this. If you agree to something like this at the very beginning, you are going to have to agree to things during the project that are as onerous as this. 
So let this be a sign of what's to come and walk away from it. I am sure nobody has had this happen. <laughs> Client brings in another designer to work on the project. That's a fireable offense. We have been hired to solve a problem. It's our job to solve that, to work with the client to solve that problem. If the client decides to bring in somebody else, we're now in competition for that person for the client's time, and we now have to compete with that person. That is not what we signed up to do. We've been in situations like this where we have had to fire clients, and yes, you can fire a client as much as they can fire you. It should be in the contract. Um, we, one in particular, the situation had deteriorated to such a point that we knew that there was no, there was no way out of it other than to walk away. And um, it led to a very uncomfortable phone call with the client. And uh, they threatened legal action. And that's actually how we found Gabe. Almost six years ago. Yeah. Mike. 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 <laughs> so the two things that I hear most, like I get people who, who contact me, they're like, telling me like, hey, something just happened with this project. I'm having trouble getting paid. The, I've submitted my invoice weeks ago. I haven't heard anything. And my first advice, my, my advice to them is, is usually, you need to talk to a lawyer about this stuff. And there's two things that I hear most often. Lawyers are so, are lawyers too expensive? I can't afford to talk to a lawyer. And the second is, are we at that point already, do you think? To answer the first, this guy makes me money. This guy has, has gotten our contracts to such a point where um, we're, we're no longer leaving that money on the table. We're protecting ourselves really well. What I pay him is a pittance of the money that I would have lost had, had I not had him taking care of this stuff. And secondly, um, you're at the point where you need a lawyer when you've decided to stop being a design amateur and become a design professional. It's time to bring in a legal professional to at least look at those contracts that you're signing with clients. There are two checks I write every month that I'm very happy to write. The first one is to him. The second one is to my therapist. <laughs> and um, on, on the money front, that's uncomfortable both in your situation with your clients and in my situation with my clients. Um, and um, it's uncomfortable at least for the clients that are coming in. So I try to make them comfortable, and I think any good lawyer would. Um, ask questions. If you're worried about how much you're going to pay, I'm happy, and I'm sure most lawyers are happy to tell you, at least decent ones, if that term isn't an oxymoron for you, um, what you're going to expect to uh, have to pay with regard to a particular project. And most attorneys um, will give you 30 minutes, maybe even an hour of free time. So um, that's not to say you should go around trying to get a bunch of free advice from lots of different <laughs> attorneys. But you know, if interview a couple attorneys, um, just like you would any, you know, anybody else, do your due diligence on, you know, there's, there's websites out there. I, I don't know how much Yelp, but other websites that talk about attorneys. Um, and ask questions. And, and if they don't answer your questions about how much something might cost in a way that satisfies you, go find another attorney. So we got a quick list of the top six things you need to know about contracts that uh, we whipped together. We'll, we'll go through them real quick. Um, number one most important thing, contracts protect both parties. A uh, contract is in place to protect you and a contract is in place to protect the client. Should anything weird happen on either end, what to do is stipulated in that contract. Yeah, and we'll, we'll actually hit this in a slide or two, but um, the process of negotiation makes, makes the thing fair. Um, and uh, if you, you know, if you roll over um, or you just sign blindly, whichever side does that, it's not going to be fair. Don't start work without a contract. Starting work without a contract is like putting a condom on after you've taken a home pregnancy test. It is just not going to help you at that point. You have lost any leverage that you had. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's not a lot more to say. <laughs> I don't know how you follow that. 
don't blindly accept their terms. Uh, we, we have had contracts handed to us by clients that were written years ago by people who are no longer working there. They have no idea what's in the contracts. We've seen contracts that stipulated that work needed to be delivered on five and a quarter inch discs when we were done. They don't know what's in them. You need to have a, uh, your, your lawyer review them and make sure that they're okay. And if something's not working for you, strike it. Yeah, again, the process of negotiation is what makes the contract fair. Um, if you're blindly accepting terms from uh, your client, and particularly if your client is an established business, chances are you know, they've had a lawyer uh, draft a contract for them. And when I'm doing that, I usually start with my wish list. You know, and, I, and I tell the client that you know, these, are, these are items where your, your, your clients are going to push back, and, and frequently they do. So if you just sign on the dotted line, you're going to be agreeing to a lot of things that you probably can't deliver and you don't want to agree to. And we'll hit that, those points a little bit later. There's always going to be some amount of negotiation, but there are things that you shouldn't back down on. This is the stuff that we don't back down on. Um, IP transfers on full payment. This is the most leverage that you have on a project, is that the work that you've done is yours until the client pays you for it. If they use that work before they've submitted a final payment, you can sue the hell out of them. Uh, termination, kill fee. Yeah, real quickly on the first point. Um, I mean, again, if you're getting a contract from, a, from an established business, what you're going to get is two, two pages of intellectual property assignment where you give them everything and you keep nothing. Um, and the way it's going to be written is it happens instantly when you sign the contract. Um, you know, I had some difficulty when I started dealing with this at first in, in trying to parse out, you know, what transferred when and blah, blah, blah. And, and I found that the easiest way to deal with this is just say at the beginning of this very long two-page assignment provision, upon full payment for the services, everything happens. So in conjunction with that, that's something that really does help guarantee payment. Um, in conjunction with that, you you have a termination or a kill fee in your contract. And this is something that I've seen in a lot of um, the web services contracts that I've looked at. Um, so it seems to be something of an industry standard. Um, and uh, you, know, you get your payment, your deposit, and then maybe you have a second payment or you break it out into three payments. And what the kill fee is, is it's, it's an amount that the client is going to have to pay um, if the client terminates without some very good reason. Um, that is over and above you know, what they've already given you in the deposit to ensure that you haven't done a bunch of work and invested a bunch of time and turned away other projects that you could have been working on um, for no good reason. Liability. Liability. Which you told me is legal for what? Oh gosh, what did I say? Uh, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so liability is just a broad term, one of those legalese that means you know, something's gone wrong and, and now you, you bear that responsibility for dealing with that problem. Um, and in these contracts that you get from established businesses, and sometimes not even established businesses, you can pick them off the internet now. Um, so somebody could be handing you a contract that you know, uh, somebody from some giant law firm drafted to protect their client, even though that wasn't their lawyer. And what these contracts say is you, know, you will have a couple pages of representations and warranties that you make about the work that you're delivering. Um, and, it, and it represents, you know, and I'm not just talking about good work, it's you know, you're not infringing on anybody else's rights. Maybe it says there's no open source code in there. Maybe it says you know, there's nothing that you've purchased such as stock pictures. Um, and if you ignore that and just sign it, um, and you get in, in trouble later. Some of them say there's not going to be any bugs. Nothing's going to go wrong. If something goes wrong with the website and it costs the company money, you sign those contracts without looking at them, you might have to pay that company money. That's liability. Lawyers talk to lawyers. Uh, if I'm talking to a client and they tell me that they have legal on the phone, we, finish, we wrap up the call and we wait till we have legal on the phone with us. Um, lawyer, people hire lawyers to protect them, and they're very good at it. He's very good at protecting me. And if he's not on the phone with their lawyer, then they're going to be telling me things, and I'm going to be agreeing to things because I'm nervous, because there's a lawyer on the phone. So the minute they show theirs, I have to show mine. <laughs> Are 
great. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> Be specific and confident about money. Money is an incredibly nerve-wracking thing to talk about. Um, but if you are trying to convince somebody to give you their money and that you're the right person to give it to, and they're asking you how much something costs, and the first thing out of your mouth is, um, you just lost 10 grand. If you know how much something costs, stand up confidently and tell them. If you don't know how much something costs, then say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out, and I'm going to get back to you as soon as possible. But just sound like you know what you're talking about, even when you don't, because you can always find out later. A couple of, uh, about a month ago, I did a podcast with Den Benjamin where I talked about um, being confident about, you know, asking, being confident about asking for your rate. And a couple days later, this came up, this guy who I, I don't know. Uh, it says, I quoted a company an absurdly higher rate than I ever have after listening to you, and I got the gig. Uh, one, I, I bet that wasn't an absurdly high rate. I bet this guy had been undercharging for years. But he had the confidence to go in and ask for the rate that he actually could have been getting all that time, and he got it. So that made me feel good. Just hope his client isn't following him on Twitter. <laughs> that was good, you got one off. <laughs> so to sum up our three-point winning strategy, contracts up front. Make sure you've got a contract in place before you start working. Make internal allies when you can. You need, to, you need to have somebody working with the client who knows the ins and outs of how the, the client runs their business and who to talk to should something weird happen. And then work with advisors like this guy on your side who are helping you and giving you good advice. Yeah, I, I hope so, yeah. And I know this wasn't as much fun as coming in here and talking about like typography and color and design and layout and grids. But if you learn a little bit about this stuff and just feel a little confident about this stuff, you can do that stuff, the stuff that you really love doing, that much longer and that much better if you just get this stuff locked up. Then you can enjoy what you really love doing. Because I love design and I love designers and I want designers to know that they actually have a lot more power than they think they have. It's Friday, you've got one more day in the work week. Go out there and do something really awesome. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna let Gabe uh, use the mic here. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you want to speak a question, please stand up and speak very loud. Are you still on? Hello? Yes. Yes. You want to call me? Any questions? Uh, I have a question about the scenario you talked about where um, the client goes rogue and they decide to change the project. And so you have to, you're in that moment, say you're like halfway through, <coughs> and at this point you can either charge, you could do the kill fee and charge them by the deliverable. You know, like I've, I've done this kind of work for you now, so I'm going to charge you this. Or do you just charge them for the project? Let me address one thing you said before I turn it over to Gabe for the legal answer. Um, you Not said legal advice, disclaimer provided. <laughs> You said the client was making you change something. A client cannot make you do anything. If you are not comfortable with what a client is asking you to do, walk away. You are, you, nobody here is held hostage to a client's whims. So are, are you asking how, how they have it, how we have it structured in their, in their contract or? Yeah. yeah. 
there, so there, there's various ways to deal with it, but um, it would, it, I maybe misspoke, but it goes, when I talked about it, it goes over and above sort of, you know, what the hourly work that you've done. Um, so there is, you know, say you're in phase two of, of three phases in the project and each phase is, is $10,000. Um, you know, the kill fee might just be, you've got your $10,000 deposit um, and then phase two is going to be $10,000 and they pay it upon, you know, some, some receivables deadline. Um, if, they, if they kill it without a good reason in the middle of phase two, you get the whole 10 for the second phase. That's a somewhat common example of a kill fee. Does that answer the question? Okay. Anybody else? Um, when you're talking about the contract, um, how do you approach um, late payment? Like, when you set a date or your date from the final or something like that, how do you treat that as a final? Even if you accept it, like, I think late. How would you put the contract? Um, you might have a, um, you know, a small we don't like to call it a penalty in the legal world because penalties aren't enforceable, but it is a penalty. It's, it's a, you know, call it interest or whatever you want, but it's a small percentage for, um, you know, something if you're working net 30 that's not paid 30 days um, after you send the invoice. And then if it's out, you know, 60 days or 90 days or 120 days, boom, you kill the contract, you get the kill fee, um, and if you have to sue them, your, your attorney's fees. Do you have any tips on firing your clients? That's such a softball for him. <laughs> you need, well, the reason that you're firing the client needs to be solid, and it needs to be in writing, and the client needs to be very aware that they've, um, they've transgressed against X thing in the contract, and this is why they're being fired. And um, do it quickly and do it clearly. They they should know they're getting fired, um, and you know do it as kindly as possible. Because again, this isn't somebody who walked into a relationship with you to be a dick. This is just a relationship that went sour. So do it with as much respect as possible. Yeah, perfect answer. Bet you weren't expecting that. that, that was, <laughs> he's learned. Horse head in bed. <laughs> and that's what he did when I met him. Anyone else? In the back, Ms. Hamwood. Um, relationships. You're talking then about relationships. Well, often you really like the people, even though, because, you know, like, we're just, we do design work and we're, um, you know, trying to tie up these points. Well, they're doing work and maybe their ability to, to tie up contracts isn't so great. So maybe they're really messing us around, but it's partly because they're just having all their shit together. So we want to keep the relationship, but we want to protect ourselves at the same time. So what about advice for handling those situations where, you know, they are really messing you around, but you want the relationship? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really... Okay, they're messing you around. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Clients messing you around. But in the same way that sometimes we don't have our contract shit together, they don't have their contract shit together, and, you, and they're good people, but they genuinely are messing you around, so it is lawyer time. But you bet you, yeah. <laughs> and I seriously, I've had to do that. I've had to lawyer up, and it was the right thing to do. Um, but how do you? What are the, what's advice around preserving the relationship, or you know, like not just you know that that aspect of it? First of all, I can be really nice on the phone with, <laughs> and and lawyers, and one of the things that you know, I think um, you know Mike would acknowledge is this sort of stuff makes him uncomfortable still. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make me uncomfortable, and it's probably not going to make the lawyer on the other side uncomfortable. So we can have a perfectly civil conversation about it. Um, it's not like pressing the uh, atom bomb. Um, so if things, things are being held up, I think you're asking, how do you preserve the relationship and deal with the, the delay and the difficult issues? Let the lawyers deal with the delay and the difficult issues. And, and everybody's always telling me, including these guys, we need it done. So the lawyers are getting that pressure, and we know how to deal with it. I mean, the other side has got to turn it around quickly, and then I've got to turn it around quickly back to him. Yeah, and even when things go wrong, our, 
the, the first thing we try to do is to preserve the relationship. In 10 years in business, I think we've only had, we've only ever fired two clients. And we've certainly had projects get weird. Um, <laughs> but most of the time, you can resolve that stuff by just talking, talking it out with the other person. Don't do it over email. On, on the phone, if nothing else, in person, if at all possible, there are plenty of client relationships that, I've, that, that we've been able to fix just going out and having a cup of coffee with somebody and realizing that we both wanted the same thing. We just had a different way of getting there. That's good advice. Anybody else? How do you deal with the acceptance criteria both for clients and contractors? That's, that's really tricky, um, and uh, I'm still learning, to be honest, on it. Um, but uh, ideally, they have you know, a certain amount of time to reject a deliverable, and they have to do it in writing, and if they don't, it's deemed accepted. And of course, you want that, that time frame to be as short as possible, but you know, I've seen five to 10 days, or maybe five to 10 business days. Um, I assume you're, that's what you're talking about, the deliverable acceptance? Yeah, and it's also on the flip side. You work with the contract that does something like that where you don't want to pay them. Oh, you don't want to accept something from somebody. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, I would, same advice as Mike gave in firing a client. Make, make the problems clear. Um, put it in writing. Um, if you're done with them and, you know, if, 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 if the relationship can be salvaged, then... Mike said, try and salvage it. But if not, um, yeah, make the reason for the rejection very clear. Hopefully, there's something in writing to rely on, you know, a contract or maybe emails that describe what was supposed to be done. Um, yeah. We have time for one more. Mr. Sippy in the front. Uh, this is for Gabe. Uh, are you worried about what he does on Twitter? <laughs> Honestly, no. Um, you know, there's, there's been... It, <laughs> There's been some ventures. <laughs> from, from my standpoint, I, I don't want him to disclose anything that we discussed. It's, it's, it's privileged, um, so he knows that, and we've talked about it. Because um, some of the stuff we discuss is funny, and we'd like to disclose it. Um, <laughs> just for pure entertainment value. But um, also, in, in full disclosure, I don't follow Twitter that much. I'm trying to get better. Um, but, you know, my stream is full of San Francisco Giants stuff and Mike. And so, for me, it's just, it's entertainment. I don't, I don't actually worry that much about it. Just, um, as, as a rule, I never, ever talk about clients on Twitter. Um, that relationship is sacred, and Twitter's, uh, you know, it, Twitter's for dick jokes. <laughs> so, a client... You know, even if a client does something in my office that's really funny, it's, it's part of our relationship and it doesn't go on there. That's you and me, babe. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot.